Hey everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar. This is a pre-recorded one minute intro just before we go live. During tonight's webinar, we'll give you information on a very special offer that is there for a limited time. Just make sure you stick around for that because I think it's something that's going to interest a lot of you. We are about to retire one of our courses and therefore we're offering a very, very special rate on it and some special bonuses that have never been available before. So make sure you stick around for that. It's coming up later in tonight's webinar. Thanks. Okay, folks, welcome to the webinar today, free webinar, courtesy of Mr. Andrew Saul. We have been inundated with your questions, and I mean inundated. Probably, I'm looking here at 49 pages of questions, so we're not getting through all those, I'll warn you in advance. So if your question's not here, I'm sorry about that, but we've had to pick and choose to a certain degree. Um, and like I say, it's just been an amazing response. So I'm asking Andrew, anyone who's on webinars with Andrew knows uh, part of Andrew's appeal is his uh, fantastic knowledge of culture and his uh, humor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I've asked him today to be a little more concise than usual. I hope that's okay, Andrew. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I like our little uh, fireside chats, and uh, I will go along with Trevor for the good of the public. <laughs> 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 Thank you, I appreciate it. So let's not waste any time. We're going to tell you later on about some other things, which is going to be of a lot of interest to you, but let's not waste any time in getting straight in there with the questions. Vitamin C, the old faithful to start with. This comes from Tim. Are there any known problems associated with long-term, high-dose vitamin C intake? Yes, there are. Um, one is the possibility of low copper. However, this is very rare because most people have too much copper. If you read the work of Dr. Carl C. Pfeiffer, MD, you will realize that we suffer from copper overload and it's actually beneficial to not have so much copper. Why is that? Well, there's copper in most water pipes for a start. And if you take more vitamin C, you could lower your available copper. I don't see that as a problem, and I've never run into a single person for which it was a problem. The second problem with long-term high-dose vitamin C intake for some people is they may have some kind of stomach distress. If you take very high doses, you may find that you feel a little uncomfortable. Vitamin C is a weak acid, but still, it can, in some sensitive people, be a problem. The solution to this is easy. You take buffered vitamin C. Outside of that, the biggest problem with long-term high-dose vitamin C is best said by Dr. Abram Hoffer, you're going to live a lot longer. Is that a problem for you? <laughs> okay, this is from Dave and Judy. Is your vitamin C intake, I presume they're asking you specifically, from ascorbic acid or from another source? And how much does it cost you? I get the cheapest ascorbic acid I can find. How much does it cost? Go on the internet. You can pick up uh, vitamin C as ascorbic acid for somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 to $20 a pound. A pound is 454 grams. That's 454,000 milligrams. That's nearly half a million milligrams for $15 to $20. It's very inexpensive, and by the way, I'm not making this idea up. It's Linus Pauling who suggested that you take pure vitamin C crystals and a little juice, divide the dose. Okay, this one's from Laurie. I can't afford to take high doses of non-GMO vitamin C powder. There are times I can't even afford the cheap stuff. Am I doing myself more harm than good if I take 5,000 milligrams daily of ascorbic acid powder, which is probably derived from GMO corn? Can it be damaging to the beneficial gut microbiome? Can it be beneficial to... Sorry, that, that, I made a mistake there. Can it be damaging to the beneficial gut microbiome? Okay, the C is beneficial and it's not going to harm your friendly gut bacteria. First of all, your stomach acid is very, very strong. It's much stronger than vitamin C, which is a very weak acid. So if anything, we're going to kill off your beneficial gut microbiome, it would be the acid that you secrete in your stomach that goes right down through the duodenum into your small intestine. And if that's not going to kill the little guys off, vitamin C certainly isn't either, any more than uh, vinegar or um, a tart lemonade. As far as uh, GMO goes, I am opposed to GMOs, but it has no bearing biologically and certainly no bearing chemically and absolutely no bearing physically on vitamin C as a molecule. Vitamin C is C6H8 
O6. There is only one way you can arrange those atoms into a vitamin C molecule. And GMOs do not work at the molecular, at the atomic level. They just don't. So if you can afford non-GMO, more power to you. If you can't, take lots of C because the issue is your health. And if money is tight, go cheap. I've been saying this for a long time. This is why the health products industry doesn't particularly care to have me talk so much, but that's the way it goes. Most people don't have a lot of money. Take a lot of C, get the cheap stuff. Take a lot of it, get the cheap stuff. Take a lot of it. People will try to tell you that it's going to harm you. That's not true. If you ever watched Leave it to Beaver, the wonderful black and white TV show in the United States back in the early 60s, Beaver's father, Ward Cleaver, famously said to Beaver one day, who was puzzling over what to do because his friends said things that were totally different to what his parents said. Ward said to Beaver, you know, a lot of people will go through their life trying to tell you that the things that are good for you are wrong. Cheap vitamin C is good for you. Okay. What is your recommendation for vitamin C and vitamin A for infants? This lady says she can only find a doctor yourself for toddler age. Well, that's why Dr. Ralph Campbell, a retired pediatrician, and I wrote uh, the vitamin cure for infant and toddler health problems. So this book does talk about infants and will give you a lot of information. That's Campbell, Dr. Ralph Campbell. Dr. Campbell, by the way, is now 89 and he still puts out his own irrigation pipes for his cherry orchard. He is a full-time farmer. You gotta love that. <laughs> Very good. What is the best form of vitamin C to take? Uh, Vicky says that some like sodium ascorbate have a lot of undesirable sodium in them and others have different ingredients that everyone says are necessary. Some say natural food based are best. Some say synthetic vitamin C is just fine. What's the truth? The truth is you're being needlessly confused. It doesn't matter what form of C you take as long as it agrees with you. If you find that a certain kind of C is better for you, wonderful. Go get lots of it. But the secret is lots of it. Sodium ascorbate is pH neutral. It is not acidic. The amount of sodium in there is not that great. Compare that to the amount of sodium in fast food, junk food, and most restaurant food, and you will find it's a laughable worry. It just isn't a problem unless you're taking huge doses of vitamin C. And at that point, I would simply take sodium ascorbate mixed with ascorbic acid, or if you need another form of buffer, calcium ascorbate mixed with ascorbic acid, or just have your ascorbic acid with more food or more liquid. That will buffer it too. Uh, Food-based vitamin C simply means that somebody is making a very, very large amount of money selling you something that is actually fairly expensive to make. That's why there's synthetic vitamin C, to keep the cost down. If you want to get food-based vitamin C, I would simply have you have a huge amount of fresh fruit. If you want to go food-based, why are you buying a supplement? Why don't you just buy the food? Okay. One from Kathy. Kathy, I can almost answer this for you because Andrew's covered it already. The best form of vitamin C, are they all equal or does ascorbic acid work as well as the more expensive brands? Andrew, I'll let you answer that in one or two sentences if you would. Sure. Um, the cheap ascorbic acid works as well or better because they are identical at the molecular level. A lot of people keep going on this saying, well, it's got to be the vitamin C complex. The rest of the things that work with vitamin C are found in food. That's why you eat fruit. But fruit is low in ascorbic acid, and it's high in all the natural vitamin C cofactors. So what do I do? What should you do? In my opinion, take ascorbic acid in quantity and have lots of fresh fruit. Okay, can megadoses of vitamin C cause gout? No, actually what will happen if you have gout and you take megadoses of vitamin C, it will start to release the uric acid crystals into your body, into your bloodstream, and it will look like you're making a problem. But what you're really doing is freeing it up so it can be excreted. So vitamin C actually is curative of gout, but recognize that gout is a very painful condition, and if you have it, your problem isn't just your vitamin C level. Probably you've had too much protein, and you've got some other issues in there as well. There might even be a genetic factor in there. But basically, vitamin C does not cause gout, 
It helps prevent it. It helps you actually cure it, but not immediately and not without some other considerations. If you have gout, the first thing you want to do is start having huge amounts of tart sour cherries. And if you can't get those, you can buy tart sour cherry juice. Make sure it's organic and you can consume this in quantity. I have a friend with gout who uh, was on the phone with me once and he was wondering about that. He said, well, how much of that organic tart sour cherry juice do I have to drink a day? I said, well, it isn't the juice, actually. I want you to get the concentrate. Oh, okay. Well, how much of that tart, sour, cherry juice concentrate should I drink a day? And I said, oh, about a bottle a day. You could hear him from two rooms away. My wife heard, a day? <laughs> it was hysterical. <laughs> but sour cherries, tart cherries, this really helps to get rid of the symptoms of gout. Sounds a little weird, but it works. Vitamin C will also help him. Okay, I'm smiling to myself because I know the answer that's coming here. Carol says, I'm almost 82 and I want to increase my vitamin C, ascorbic acid, minus 500 milligrams four times a day. How will I know when I've taken too much? You'll be at saturation, also known as bowel tolerance. And Carol, that means exactly what you think it means. You take as much C as you can comfortably hold, but not so much as gives you loose stool. Loose stool or flatulence, gas, the rumble in the tummy, that's close enough. That's the marker. Saturation is bowel tolerance. This is the work of Dr. Robert Fulton Cathcart III, a medical doctor and orthopedic surgeon for whom I have limitless admiration. And by the way, Linus Pauling admired Robert Cathcart. Hmm. Okay, a couple of questions from Darlene. First one, if you have 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C, ascorbate acid powder, and 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C calcium ascorbate powder. Which of those would give you more vitamin C, I think is the question. Which is the more absorbable? Well, they're both absorbable because when you take calcium ascorbate or hydrogen ascorbate, which would be ascorbic acid, either way, when dissolved in water in your body, you're going to have ascorbate. Ascorbate is the business end of the molecule. That's why it can be sodium ascorbate, hydrogen ascorbate, or ascorbic acid, or calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate, it doesn't really matter, because the ascorbate is what you want. Calcium ascorbate is actually less effective than uh, ascorbic acid, and you get better results using ascorbic acid. Calcium ascorbate is for people that either have stomach issues, sensitive tummy, or calcium ascorbate is good for chewables, or any time you have contact of any length of time with the teeth. Calcium ascorbate is non-acidic and therefore it's better for the teeth. If you are taking ascorbic acid, you should always rinse your mouth. And I usually have a bite of cheese after I have uh, vitamin C as ascorbic acid. But ascorbate is a small, small molecule and it's smaller than the simplest sugar. Do you know a kid that can't absorb glucose? <laughs> <laughs> you wish you did if you were a teacher. This is a small molecule, so ascorbate goes right in. There is no uh, absorption issue with vitamin C. Okay. And the same lady says that her bowel tolerance level is around 1,700 milligrams per day. Is there a vitamin C product that she could take that would enable her to get more vitamin C before reaching bowel tolerance? Why would you want to? If your bowel tolerance is 1,700 milligrams a day, Dr. Cathcart would say, you're done. If you're healthy. Now, if you have what you think is bowel tolerance at 1,700 milligrams a day and you're not healthy, something's going on. You may have something that you think is bowel tolerance. It could simply be you have other bowel symptoms. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people are flatulent, folks. Uh, there's a lot of people why people have constipation or diarrhea. The whole world is not entirely due to your vitamin C level. It's just the very large amount of health care is due to your vitamin C level. You take enough C to be symptom free, whatever the amount might be. Take the amount that works for you. Or if you want to keep it in the poem, take the amount that works for thee. <clears throat> <laughs> That's an old one. Okay, this one is from Dean. And I'm not sure Dean gives us enough information, but here we go. Dean's wife and himself have started vitamin C therapy with 15 to 25 grams per day. They're both experiencing headaches. Will they subside? Is the dose too large? Uh, he says he does not have diarrhea, but does have a headache and gas. And that's after day two of the therapy. We need to do what's comfortable. Again, if 
I were doing this, if I had gas, I would say, hmm, maybe I'm taking too much C and I would lower it. You can try that and see what happens. If you take less C and you feel better and you don't have the headache or the gas, you're done. If you take less C and you still have the headache and gas, well, you could try taking no C and see if you have headache and gas. You know, you might just have a headache for other reasons. You might have gas because you eat too many beans or you don't chew your food well or you like bagels and pizza. Try having more rice, ha try having more salads. This will help to improve that. With your headache, go and see a chiropractor. That could help. Drink more water, that will help. There's lots of factors here. Generally speaking though, if you take a lot of C and if you have gas, you're taking too much. Okay, one from Mary Lou. I've been, uh, I think she means I've been unable to find, yes, yeah, sorry, I've been able to find very little information on vitamin C enemas. Might they provide an effective treatment in the absence of vitamin C IVs? I don't think so. The vitamin C IV is really not that hard to do. Uh, most people, when they go into hospital, are going to have an IV running anyway. It's not that difficult to tap in uh, vitamin C as well. Um, absorption, again, of ascorbate is so good, there's really no need to go through all those gyrations. Okay. The easiest vitamin C, there's no name in this, the easiest vitamin C to give children is the powdered form in orange juice. I have heard that this will ruin your teeth. You are talking megadosing every few hours, even minutes. Could you answer if this powdered vitamin C will actually damage tooth enamel, especially in megadosing? The person I'm referring to cannot rinse out their mouth due to severe disability, and I would hate to ruin their teeth uh, while trying to help them with their allergies. Well, in this particular case, if you cannot rinse, you do not do you don't give ascorbic acid to someone who can't rinse their mouth out. That's just common sense. I, again, not only rinse my mouth after I have vitamin C as ascorbic acid in solution, but I also have a piece of cheese or a piece of bread or a piece of fruit or some kind of food as well to make sure there's no trace in there. You can use calcium ascorbate. You can use sodium ascorbate. Calcium ascorbate and sodium ascorbate are pH uh, neutral. There's no acidity there at all. In fact, calcium ascorbate is good for people that have gum issues. You can pack that stuff right along the margin of the gum. Doesn't hurt the teeth and does help the gums. Allergies do respond to high doses of vitamin C in most cases. I know one lady who had every allergy there was. She was tested for 128 different things. She was allergic to everything. <laughs> she started taking high doses of vitamin C. She was tested again. She was allergic to nothing. It was really quite dramatic. Uh, that doesn't always happen quite that well. But vitamin C is an antihistamine and an antitoxin, and it works really well. Sodium ascorbate, calcium ascorbate, IV vitamin C, all these options are available to you. Is it true that vitamin C can help the severity and the length of shingles? And the lady oh. says, anyone with shingles will really appreciate this answer. Well, this has been known for a long time. Dr. Frederick Robert Conner and Dr. Robert F. Cathcart, these are physicians that knew this 30, 40, 50 years ago. Very high doses of vitamin C are extremely effective against shingles. Shingles is a virus, it's painful, and it's a problem, and people are scared right out of their minds over this because the purveyors of vaccinations and drugs are trying to panic you into thinking you're gonna get it, particularly if you never had a chicken pot shot. But that's not true. You can take huge amounts of vitamin C and you can inactivate those viruses. It just works. In fact, in desperate cases, you can take vitamin C and put it right on the skin. Of course, you don't use ascorbic acid for that because it's gonna hurt. It would be like putting vinegar on the skin. Don't do that. You can use calcium ascorbate poultices. Put it right on the skin if you like. Take oral doses. In severe cases, IV. The amount of vitamin C that a person with shingles will hold is astronomically high. But you don't send a boy to do a man's job, as Dr. Conner said. You take enough C to be symptom-free, whatever the amount might be. And if someone has shingles, their need is very, very strong for vitamin C. Okay, Jean says, I've recently learned that vitamin C supplements are mainly produced in China with the, pure, with the poor quality and purity control associated with supplements made in China. Should we be worried? And then there, are there any safe alternatives? Well, we need to um, stop hammering China here for just a minute. Uh, the fact of the matter is the manufacture of ascorbic acid 
was streamlined by the Chinese who invented a process for producing high quality ascorbic acid in the 1960s. And the price of vitamin C went down dramatically, which was good because around 1970, Linus Pauling published vitamin C in the common cold and sales went through the roof. So if the Chinese are getting rich, I don't think they're getting rich on ascorbic acid. Have you bought anything lately that wasn't from China? I hope you have. I hope you buy domestically whenever you can. But the fact is a lot of stuff comes from China and some of it's crap. But a lot of stuff comes from China and it's very high quality. It depends what you've got. If you are buying vitamin C that happens to be originally manufactured in China, you're buying it from a supplement company and they should make sure it's pure. It's up to your tabletter, it's up to your manufacturer of the supplement, the bottle, the label, the tablets, the capsules. It's their job to check their quality of vitamin C that they get from their supplier. And if it wasn't for the Chinese process and availability of vitamin C, the cost would be much, much higher. If you have oodles of money, this isn't a concern for you. For three quarters of the world, it's a big concern. So get vitamin C that's known pr purity, and you do that by interrogating the company from whom you're buying the tablets. I have not found a company yet that says to me, we don't test our vitamin C powder. <laughs> of course they do. Wouldn't you? Okay, this is from Lindsay. Lindsay says, I've read all your books since watching the Vitamin Summit. Since then, I've been really curious as to why you don't specifically recommend extended release vitamin C. With the issues surrounding absorbing vitamin C that you discuss and the need for dynamic dosing, wouldn't using an extended release formula be much better for absorption purposes and also give you the advantage of not having to take as many pills throughout the day? I've started taking the extended release version thinking that I am getting more bang for my buck and upping my levels. But part of me wonders if there's some reason you haven't suggested this. Thank you. This has been really bothering me, she says. Well, it's a good question. Common sense says, hey, sustained release or extended release or time release vitamin C. Just take the pills in the morning and it works for you all day. Good idea. And I was there when these things came out. There was a time when sustained release and extended release and time release were the big deal. And what was found, first of all, is that a lot of these tablets were not dissolving very well. They were actually going through people, giving rise to the story that plumbers were finding vitamin tablets from elderly people that never absorbed the vitamin. There is some truth in that mostly urban legend story Bottom line is this, by taking C manually, you have complete control over the dose and it will work better. If you want to use a time release product, you can, but the older you are, the less reliable it will be, the cost will go up, and personally, I think it's just not that important. Dividing the dose is important, and what this product is trying to do is to take you away from the fact that when you are really sick, like I was when I had viral pneumonia, you should be taking vitamin C constantly. I took vitamin C every six minutes when I had viral pneumonia, 2,000 milligrams every six minutes. My cough stopped in three hours, and in that three-hour period, my fever went down three degrees. Not bad. Sure, I took 60,000 milligrams of C. What do I want with time release? If you're sick, you want to wait? No. You want a loading dose, and then you want to maintain high levels. Extended release sounds good, time release sounds good, uh, but it doesn't play out as nearly as well as you think. It's not a waste of money, it's just inefficient, which to me is a waste of money. Okay, this person says, I really love your work, Andrew. Some doctors here have said that ascorbic acid is oxidant and that is dangerous. What's your opinion on that? <laughs> well, somebody missed the first day of school in Chemistry 101. The whole world knows that ascorbic acid is an antioxidant. Hello? It is a reducing agent. It provides an electron. That's what it does when it dissolves in water, it provides an electron. And this is what Dr. Robert Cathcart, remember him, said that vitamin C is the non-rate limited free radical scavenger. And in everyday terms, that means that it provides lots and lots and lots and lots of combat against free radicals. So it's a reducing agent. It is, the, it is the solution to the problem. Vitamin C is not 
an oxidant. It is an antioxidant. And anyone who tells you that it's an oxidant has got their head on in a unique way. The only time vitamin C appears to act as an oxidant is inside a cancer cell. And cancer cells are weird. Now, there's a surprise. And inside a cancer cell, a vitamin C has oxidant characteristics. Even though it's an antioxidant, inside a cancer cell, so it works as an oxidant and kills the cancer cell. But it's well known, even the American National Institutes of Health admit this, it's well known that vitamin C, even in huge quantity, does not harm healthy cells. It has that oxidant-like property inside a cancer cell. For normal people, vitamin C is, has, and always will be an antioxidant. Okay. And uh, one last quick one on vitamin C before we move on to something slightly different. Aline asks, can I dissolve vitamin C in water, store it in a glass bottle in the fridge and consume it throughout the day or will it lose its strength? Yes, you can and yes, it will. And why bother? I mean, you know, it's just, is it that much harder to take out the bottle and uncap it and drink it or take out the bottle of water, put it in a glass with a little C and drink it? I've seen video of Linus Pauling and his wife, Ava Helen Pauling, actually doing exactly that. They take a little C, they put it in the cup, they put in some water, and they drink it. Hey, if it's good enough for Linus Pauling, it's good enough for you. All right, let's say you're at work. Let's say you can't get to your vitamin C store. Let's say you're in a restaurant or on a plane or visiting relatives, and they don't want to see you putting suspicious-looking white powder in a glass and downing it. Maybe the social circumstances are such that you can't do it. Yes, you can. You can put vitamin C in water, but vitamin C loses its stability once it is in solution. Powdered ascorbic acid will keep for years. It's actually the most stable form of vitamin C. That's something that people don't tell you when they're hawking other types of vitamin Cs. The most stable form of vitamin C by far is pure ascorbic acid. But once you put it into water, it dissociates. That means the hydrogen comes off the ascorbate molecule, and now the ascorbate molecule is looking around for things to neutralize. And if there's any oxidants in the water, or just oxygen in the water, guess what's gonna happen? Hmm? So the secret is if you must pre-dissolve your vitamin C, put in a lot more than you think you're gonna need, and keep it tightly capped. Is it better than nothing? Oh, absolutely. But I still favor mixing it up fresh. But if you're in a public place, your solution is probably a good one. Okay. Um, what a lot of you won't know, folks, just to let you know, um, this is a webinar we're doing for free with all these questions, and there are hundreds of them. We do this on a regular basis as part of the Mega Vitamin Formula, which is Andrew's e-course, which we launched about two years ago, and we've had many, many hundreds of people go through that. Andrew, I just want to ask you, um, because I know you actually really, really enjoy doing the course, and I just want to ask you to share with people for a couple of minutes your experience we've had over the last couple of years of doing that. Well, I do enjoy doing the course. This is fun. I've been doing this for 41 years now, and after a while, you kind of get into it. The best part are the reports from people that have had huge improvements in their health, and what really astonishes me is that relatively small things give such large benefit. In healthcare, we think in terms of huge amounts of money being spent just to make the symptoms a little less or to get someone who's in serious illness to have enough improvement where they can learn to live with the rest of it. Huge amounts of pain and suffering and time and money are being spent on relatively inefficient gains. Whereas with vitamin therapy, you're addressing a fundamental cause of illness, which is bad nutrition. We overeat, but we're undernourished. This is true. And look at the hospital food. Look at what people eat in schools. Look what they're fed in nursing homes. Oh my heavens. What we're trying to do is break out of this idea that you have to spend a huge amount of money on medical care or a huge amount of money on supplements in order to be well. And the mega vitamin formula course is getting down to the simple, the basics, the stuff that really works, it's cheap. And nobody's gonna tell you about that because it's cheap. Why would they wanna put themselves out of business? Why would the pharmaceutical industry or a hospital wanna tell you how to not need them? Why would people that make money offering 20, 30, 40, 500, 1,000, I know one vitamin company that has 10,000 products for sale. Why would they wanna reduce this down to just a few simple rules? Well, they don't, but I do. 
So I love the work. I love helping people. I have the greatest job in the world, and it is a blast to see people embracing this. And they write to me, and I get all these wonderful stories about people. Wow, I used to have alcoholism. Oh, <laughs> really? That's kind of nice. Here's a story for you. You're going to like this. This was a neighbor of mine, okay? Her uh, four-year-old got into the chewable vitamin C and ate the whole bottle. And the lady came over to me and said, you know, this happened. Uh, is this a problem? And I said, well, um, has he had any symptoms? And she said, well, his asthma went away. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. So I'll tell you a little more about the course later on, folks, because I know some of you are going to be very interested in that. But let's get let's get back to some more questions. Um, this one actually is very fitting for where you ended there, Andrew. This lady says, I've been taking so many supplements for so many years, and it is getting very expensive. How do I know what I should be taking or what my body really needs or wants? Hmm. If you're healthy, you're doing something right. If you are having a lot of gas or flight turns or loose stool, you're probably taking too much C. You do what works. It doesn't matter how you get the results you want. I refer people to Dr. Richard Passwater, who wrote one of the first great health nut books I ever read back in the 70s. The book is called Super Nutrition. It's been updated since then. Richard Passwater is just a blast. And his plan with vitamins, I find very intriguing. He said, you start taking some vitamins. And then you see how you feel. And if you feel better, you take some more vitamins. And if you feel better still, you take some more vitamins. And if you don't feel any better, you don't take any more vitamins, you stay with that. And if you feel worse, you turn around and take less vitamins. Now that sounds a little bit juvenile, but that's the whole beauty of it. It's so simple. You take enough to feel good. If you feel good and you're healthy, you're done. I had a lady come up to me once and say, well, I don't take any vitamins at all, and I feel great. And I said, yes, ma'am, you're wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I had so. another person come up to me, and they had all kinds of symptoms, and they were upset because the only way their chronic fatigue went away was when they took 35,000 milligrams of C a day. And they were upset. And I said, why? You've got the solution. When you take 35,000 milligrams of C a day, you don't have chronic fatigue, right? She said, yeah, but I don't want to take that much. I said, hello, <laughs> you, know, you have a choice here. Take enough C to be symptom free. Do what works, that's it. Okay. What is your opinion about the potency and effectiveness of making liposomal vitamin C with an ultrasonic jewelry cleaner using acerola berry and sunflower lecithin? Well, you're going to have vitamin C, and you're going to have some good stuff from what you put into it. What you get out is what you put in. But as far as that actually being liposomal vitamin C, I doubt it. I've talked to people that are close to the manufacturer of this, and they tell me that the homemade stuff is not without its merits because you're still getting something, but it's not the real deal. Therefore, go ahead and do it if it works for you. Liposomal vitamin C is extremely expensive. And many people figure they can make their own and it'll be just as good. No, it won't be just as good. Will it be good? Yes. Will it be just as good? No. You get what you pay for and your homemade approach is not going to do any harm. But it would be an error to think that it's the same thing as the patented processes that they actually use. I think a dollar per thousand milligrams of C, a dollar a gram for vitamin C is too much. And I, pr I prefer the cheap source, but if you're loaded in dough, go and buy it. And if you like to play in your kitchen and make up your own concoctions, you're not going to do yourself any harm. But in the end, you take the C that works for you. Okay. And another lady on the same sort of subject. We have all the equipment now to make liposomal encapsulated vitamin C at home. There are a lot of ways in the internet to do it. Well, sorry, it's the same question, actually. Is it really as good and how much of that should we take per day? So it's really this, you've just covered that. Um, one from Sheila, my husband started taking vitamin C thinking it might help his varicose veins. They are hereditary. He said it made his veins burn, but then after a couple of weeks, he said he wanted to try vitamin C again because even though there was a little burning sensation, he has more pain than before taking it. He was taking a thousand milligrams twice per day. 
He had laser treatment on them four or five years ago and they come back. Do you have any suggestions on the vitamin C? Or is there any other supplement that will help? Well, if you're having any discomfort or pain, just stop. If something causes you discomfort or pain, you need to immediately stop. You talk to your doctor, that's it. You know, if it hurts when you do that, then don't do that. It's just something we have to always remember. I'm not a physician, and I'm not diagnosing or prescribing or treating for anybody. I'm simply telling you what I have in terms of experience for the last four decades. And I've worked with a lot of people and a lot of doctors, and I've learned from some really smart people. Some of them, the smartest people, like Dr. Abram Hoffer and Dr. Hugh Reardon, uh, Dr. Robert Cathcart. These are brilliant people, and they have never encountered anything like this. And all the studies and reading that I've done, but if it happened, it happened, don't do it. I doubt if it was the vitamin C. Uh, I think it's much more likely that the symptoms in and of themselves are still there because you mentioned that you're still wearing, the, he's still wearing the socks, and they had the surgery and they came back. Why did they come back? This is where we come to vitamin E as an eddy. Now my father had varicose veins and they were famous throughout the neighborhood. He liked to take sun baths with his Bermuda shorts on, on his old army surplus cot out in our backyard in the middle of summer, in the sun, for about two to three hours on a Sunday afternoon. That was my father's favorite way to relax. He would just go out and wear his shorts and bake in the sun. However, everyone could see his varicose veins and they were something to see indeed. It was like looking on a roadmap of New York City. He had a lot of varicose veins. Years later, he had angina and I suggested to him he might want to take a lot of vitamin E, which he did and it helped him. The story about this is in Doctor Yourself and at the Doctor Yourself website if you want to read the whole thing. Angina, that's the pain in the left arm uh, on exertion. So he started taking vitamin E because his angina medication had side effects that were unpleasant. And when he got to 1,600 units of vitamin E a day, natural vitamin E, 1,600 units a day, his uh, angina went away and never came back. Well, the cool thing was that over the years, his varicose veins went away. Now, it took a long time. I would say it took around eight years. But first they went from blackish purple to purple to purpley blue to bluish red to reddish pink and then to light red and then to pink and then they were largely gone. Now there were still a few, but they were largely gone. And I thought, this is interesting. I don't know if this is hereditary or not, but I had some varicose veins when I was a young man. I don't know exactly how, but these things happen. So I thought, I'm gonna take more vitamin E. And I did, and guess what? They're virtually gone. And I have a chance to watch this, maybe it's placebo effect, but this is one heck of a placebo. So vitamin E as an eddy seems to help to really um, get rid of the varicose veins, but it is a very slow process. With most people, varicose veins don't get better in eight years. They're either gonna stay the same if you're lucky, or they're gonna get worse. So it's a slow cure, but sometimes nature works that way. It takes nine months to make a baby. I think you've basically answered this question, but I'll let you very quickly um, summarize again. Lloyd asked how much vitamin C can one realistically take at a time? What's the maximum dose uh, to be absorbed by the body? And does one have to build up to that level? And is there a maximum level? Everybody dislikes my answer, and that's why I keep getting the same question. Bowel tolerance. I don't know how much you need. You don't know how much you need. You're going to need different amounts on different days. Different people, same circumstance. Same people, different circumstance. You, on Friday night and Monday morning, middle of the night, middle of the day, sick or well, stressed or not, vacation or working. Your level of vitamin C saturation is invariably indicated by bowel tolerance. By the way, this does not work with IV vitamin C. There is no bowel tolerance symptom there. But with oral doses of vitamin C, you're going to get to bowel tolerance. And that tells you at the moment you have enough. And the idea is to continue dividing the dose, which you have to do with any water-soluble vitamin, B-complex or C, 
because you're constantly getting rid of it, which is good. That's the way you work. So you constantly bring in more, you constantly excrete. It's like fresh air. It's like a ventilation system. You could actually look at it that way, that you are bringing in fresh vitamin C, you're improving your immune system, detoxing your body, and you bring in some more. You use it up, you take some more. So bowel tolerance is the answer. Okay. Robert asks, where do you buy your vitamin C? And when's the Andrew Saul line of vitamins coming out? Well, we've thought about Mega Vitamin Man multiples. And I'm toying with a line of Mega Vitamin Man makeup. I think that's really where the dough is, is to be made. Uh, I've seen what cosmetics go for. And I don't know, I think I could use a few billion dollars in that. But the fact is, um, I won't tell you where I get my vitamin C. And I'm not going to have a line of vitamins. And why is that? Well, first of all, you need to do what's right for you. So you need to get on the internet and see all the different places that sell vitamin C. And then based on what you've learned, make the best decision for yourself. I get the cheapest C I can find. And it's ascorbic acid and it works. If you have more money or if you have some viewpoints of your own, go ahead and follow them. I don't care what form you take. I care that you take enough. I don't care what company you deal with. I care that you take enough. I think it would be good if you didn't lose an awful lot of money in the process, but some people are bound and determined to buy a Mercedes-Benz automobile when, quite frankly, they would probably do just about as well in terms of comfort, safety, and efficiency by having a Honda. Now, I'm not saying a Mercedes isn't a wonderful car. It's a fabulous car, gorgeous car, wonderful car, beautiful engineering, and they're extremely expensive. And Hondas, are they as good as a Mercedes? No. But are they a pretty good car? Yeah. Are they a lot cheaper? Sure. And truth to be told, you don't even need a Honda. There's probably another car out there that's less than that. And will it work? Sure. So it's a matter of choice. In the same way that you have all these different automobiles to choose from, you also have all these different vitamin companies to choose from. Why? I don't know. We really don't need that, but this is a free society and we have choice. So use your choice. Look into it for yourself. I take the cheapest C I can, I take a lot of it and I take it often. And that's what Linus Pauling did. He has two more Nobel Prizes than you or I. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let me interject there because that's actually what drew me to your work in the first place, Andrew. Um, when I watched Food Matters and I saw all the experts, you were one of the rare ones who didn't actually endorse something. And I got an email today from someone who's very big in this health, natural health space, and they, they were sort of dishing vitamins a little and saying, you know, multivitamins, there can be so much bad stuff in there, and uh, you really got to be careful. And then at the bottom, the link was, of course, here's what me and my wife take. And you follow the link, and they're selling a very expensive multivitamin. And that's the beauty, I think, again, about the mega vitamin course, is that uh, um, mega vitamin formula, is that you're putting all that information out there, but at no stage are you trying to sell any products. And I think that gives you a lot of credibility in this space. Well, I appreciate that compliment very much, Trevor. And the only reason I don't have a financial connection with the health products industry is because I would not listen to me if me had a connection with the health products industry. Mm. So when I went up with Doctor Yourself online in 1999, I was thinking to myself, you know, what kind of website should I put up? And then I thought, well, what kind of website do I want? What kind of website would I like to read? And I'd want one that had peer review by physicians, that was accurate, that had lots of good information, new information, well-referenced, and interesting and fun to read, and free, and with no product endorsements whatsoever. So that's why I'm doing this, because it's the golden rule. I'm treating you the way I want to be treated. Very good. Back to the questions. This is Pamela. Pamela has read that vitamin C in high doses can be used to treat severe pain. She, and there's a lot of big words here, which I'm not very good at, so I'll say that in advance. I have trigeminal neuralgia type 2. I am on oxcar, oxcarbazepine. It's, it's a, some sort of drug. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that. Generic to... 
Trileptil, 150 milligrams, half a tablet, four or five times a day. Side effects are terrible. Doctors say they will go away, but it's a powerful drug with possible serious medical consequences. He said not to take, and this amazes me, he said not to take large doses of vitamin C since it is not known if this will cause serious consequences. I can't drive, I cannot walk in a straight line, and my cognitive function is impaired. I am therefore totally deprived of a normal life. I am ordinarily very active. I am 73 and depressed. Okay, let's just take a straight face check here. You're taking a strong drug with likely or at least possible serious medical consequences. You can't drive, you can't walk in a straight line, your cognitive function is impaired, you're deprived of normal life, and you're being told not to take vitamin C. Do I really have to expand on this? Maybe I do. I don't understand how it's possible for a doctor to say, accept the serious consequences of these drugs that aren't working, and don't try vitamin C, which never killed anybody, which might help. Vitamin C does provide pain relief. Listen carefully. There were studies done on terminally ill cancer patients in such severe pain that they were on heroin for the pain, okay? Strong narcotics, including heroin, because their pain was that bad. When these people got high doses of vitamin C, almost all of them stopped asking for the narcotic and came off the heroin in a matter of a week or so without any withdrawal symptoms. They stopped asking for heroin or opioids and narcotics because the vitamin C, for reasons that weren't well understood, provided that level of pain relief. Now you think that went over for just a minute. So I would say vitamin C is the solution, not the problem, and I think the doctor's caution is misplaced. Yeah, this seems unbelievable. This is from an old friend of ours called Bill. Bill always gives, comes in with a few questions. And Bill says, I've read one well-known health practitioner say that you should take your vitamin C before your meals and not with your meals as you will tend to absorb more iron than you need or want. What do you think about this recommendation? Well, it's interesting, but it's probably superfluous. You have this idea somehow that the stomach is just this empty drum and just sits there doing nothing. Your stomach is alive. Your stomach is churning. You are a living organism. And if you take it before your meal and not with your meal, what are we talking, 10 minutes, 15 minutes here? Do you really think that's going to make a big difference? I don't think so. The fact of the matter is if you want to make sure you're not absorbing a lot of iron, guys, don't take a multivitamin with iron. You can get a multivitamin without iron and should. Women should have a multivitamin with iron, unless they're postmenopausal. And children need a multivitamin with iron because they're growing. They're making more blood. They need iron to do that. Pregnant women need even more iron because they're building a baby that's also building its own blood and needs iron. So the real issue here is if you're concerned about iron overload, you need to go plant-based. Meat contains heme iron for which the body has no off switch, and you will continue to absorb heme iron to the point of overload, and vitamin C does increase iron absorption. But if you go to a plant-based diet, you're getting non-heme iron, for which your body does have an off switch, and vitamin C cannot increase the iron absorption past a certain amount. Your body's smarter than you think. Thank heaven for that. If your body wasn't smart every morning, you'd wake up dead because you forgot to breathe all night. You'd forgot to pump your heart. Do you remember to pump your heart once every minute? I mean, do you? Do you run around worrying about this? Some people do. Take more niacin. But <laughs> what you have to see here, what you have to see here is that if the issue is iron overload, stop eating meat. And nobody wants to hear that. They want to say, stop taking so much C. No, take lots of C. Stop eating meat and get your iron from vegetable foods you are going to not have a problem unless you have uh, the hereditary iron issue, in which case it's another matter, but you'd know if you had that. The hemochromatosis, your doctor would have talked to you about that. That's a different ball of wax. 
But if you're just a guy like me and you're concerned about too much iron, just go plant-based. Problem solved. The hammer's going to come through that wall at any moment. You know that. Well, just so everybody can understand, I just want you to know that the FDA has a SWAT team outside of the studio right now. <laughs> And it's only a matter of time before they shut us down. So you tuned in to the greatest webinar ever because uh, this is going to be a classic. Obviously, there aren't going to be any more. And pretty soon, mysteriously, all of these videos are going to go off the Internet. And you're going to see me sell out and work for a major pharmaceutical company. No, ladies and gentlemen, what you're hearing is uh, the siding on our house is being replaced. And believe it or not, they're working far away from the studio. But sound carries very well through solids. So I do apologize for that. But it's a sunny day, and it's a good day to get the siding done. And I hope you will bear with me. Yeah, not a problem. Let me just take the chance there, folks, to tell you very quickly about the Mega Vitamin course, because I know a lot of you will be very interested in this. It's where you can ask your questions, and we guarantee you get them answered, because uh, we don't have nearly as many people involved. Um, so here's some of the details on that. So you've watched part of the webinar. You've seen Andrew knows the stuff inside out, and you know his knowledge can help you. Okay, listen, I'm not going to get all hyped up and try to get you all hyped up about what this is and how it can help. You've seen Andrew's vast knowledge. And you know by now this course can almost certainly give you major benefits. So all I want to do is quickly go over what's in the Mega Vitamin Formula course and how it could help you. If it's right for you, I'd love you to jump on board. If it's not right for you, I don't want you to do that. It's that simple. I'm going to do this without fanfare and without hype. Here's what it is. The Mega Vitamin Formula course will run for the last time in October 2016. We're replacing it in February 17 with a brand new course which will probably cost more. The Mega Vitamin Formula course consists of 21 daily video lessons from Andrew. There are audio versions as well for your MP3 player or your car, and transcripts if you prefer reading rather than watching. There's also a workbook that has a lesson every day for you to fill in to make sure you get the main points, and there are guest videos from Philip Day on Vitamin D and Helen Saul Case on Children and Vitamins. And you've 12 months access to all these videos. There are also extra bonus videos from Andrew, which he did in Vitamin Summits, one on Vitamin C, and one on Vitamin Use in the Elderly. Plus, you have the option to take the Gold or the Platinum versions, and there you have access to guaranteed answers to your questions on the Q&A webinars. And as a very special bonus, you can have your choice from a new series of videos that's not even released yet, called the Nuts and Bolts series. They'll be selling for $17 each, and you can choose any one as part of the package. All this information will put you in an unrivaled position where you finally know what's important about using vitamins and supplements to bring you better health. Naturally, if you implement everything Andrew teaches, you'll make a huge leap forward in your health journey and that of your families. And that's why we believe this genuinely is such an amazing offer. Because the course in this format's being retired, we're offering it at the lowest price it's ever been sold at. And you can get it at the link below. If you enroll today, we're going to give you access to that Vitamin Summit Special Edition, which is a collection of five of the best interviews from the Vitamin Summit, which on its own sells for $97. And finally, we'll include another 25 webinar recordings from previous courses. These will be fully searchable come December, and this information doesn't date. But these bonuses are only available until Thursday. So there you go. No hard sell. If you want it, have a look at it. Go to the link below. And jump on board all right so there you go there's the information if uh, you think it's something you're interested in by all means jump on board we'd love to have you and uh, if it's not for you at this time that's not a problem at all Andrew back to you with this is more of a statement than a question but it's very very interesting it comes from someone called Sally she said recently I read a book by a doctor who's an MD who advocates food as medicine and the use of certain vitamins and supplements he indicated that the vitamin C we buy is really only one component which you've addressed and that if we take much of it, it will cause us to become deficient in the real vitamin C, which is a complex food with many components. So Sally decided to try this using only vitamin C food-based as her source and had a relapse of her respiratory shingles, which I had the first time when I was deficient in vitamin C and magnesium in the first place. I'm usually a healthy 70-year-old, seven -old, and the respiratory shingles is a nightmare as you can imagine. I went back on my vitamin C therapy, as you, can, as you advocate, and I'm healing from the outbreak. Although my breathing is still quite noisy and I'm fatigued a little, 
but it is getting there. Please clarify the appropriateness of vitamin C as we purchase it off the shelf. I think you've already done that, but I'm sure you would love to comment on that comment of Sally's. Well, I think it's very instructive, and I appreciate very much your providing it. You have a situation here where you were getting success, and somebody told you what you're doing isn't working, even though your body said it was. You listened because you're open-minded. You stopped taking the C, the problem came back, and then you took the C and the problem went away. I think that's pretty clear cut. I'm sorry that there are still doctors who value philosophy over medicine, but there are some doctors who have a belief system or a point of view, or in some cases, a commercial investment in providing information that is partisan, that is that it's skewed towards a particular objective, a particular point of view. And I think it's a mistake to warn people off vitamin C, and you are a very good example of exactly why it's a mistake. Keep this in mind. Respiratory shingles, and you are actually healing it with, with vitamin C, and it's necessary for you to go through this twice in order to prove that it works. Well, that's enough for anybody, so I hope the rest of us can learn from you. The vitamin C you get off the shelf is fine. If you don't think it is, fine, get another kind. Go to a different shelf. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you take enough, and you have demonstrated that so clearly. Yeah, very oh, and the other comment here, that the doctor allegedly saying that if you take more ascorbic acid, you're going to become deficient in the other C factors. Well, that's just not true because the other C factors are found in fruits. Taking more C does not mean you stop eating fruit. You don't take a lot of C and then go and get a McNothing meal. What you do is you take a lot of C and you eat a whole foods diet. Or you can just eat the whole foods diet. Or if you don't like whole foods, you can take C and have the McNothing meal and you're still better off than if you had the McNothing meal and no C. It is a no-lose proposition. Take your C and eat right. And if you don't eat right, you really need your C. And if you do eat right, you still don't get enough C for respiratory shingles, which you have demonstrated. So in this case, I disagree with the doctor's assessment. I think it is a philosophical rather than a scientific assessment. Okay. May says, um, or May asks, have you heard of using vitamin C to treat UTI, urinary tract infections? I want to stay as much natural and not use antibiotics. I live in Costa Rica and the pharmacist, I believe, has given her antibiotics. I take a lot of C anyway to control mold and not to catch cold or illnesses from others. It works well for those issues. I was just wondering if you had any specific info on UTI. Yeah, actually, this is one of the classic examples of vitamin C's effectiveness. Many people are told drink cranberry juice for that to acidify the urine. That they can handle no problem. And what they actually get is usually a watered down sugary cranberry drink, which is not gonna acidify anything, let alone your urine. So vitamin C is ascorbic acid, as you can understand, will slightly acidify your urine. And not only that, the vitamin C itself works as an antibiotic, strengthening your immune system and acidifying the urine. Vitamin C in quantity also causes you to urinate a little bit more often. It's something of a diuretic. And if you're taking it in liquid, you're getting more liquid, which is always good if you have a UTI. Therefore, you're right on the nose. Vitamin C is just the thing for UTI. I've talked to a large number of men and women, especially women, over the years, and they all have said the same thing. Nothing helped their UTI. They did this, they did that, and finally they took the vitamin C, and not only did they get rid of the thing right away, but they didn't have any more as long as they kept taking the vitamin C. So, great idea. Lucy asks, are there any vitamins which are incompatible with each other or with food? Not really. There's a form or two of iron that you really shouldn't take with vitamin E, but the short answer to your question is no. The whole idea of a multivitamin or even a balanced diet would be knocked into a loop if there was a problem. We have this weird idea that vitamins don't get along well with each other. That's because drugs don't get along well with each other. This is an entirely different situation. Let's take a look at a World Series winning baseball team. 
You think those guys don't get along with each other? My guess is that even if they have personal issues, they still get along real well because they play well on the field. And you know, I don't care what they're doing off the field. We want them to win the World Series. On the field, they work together. They are synergistic. They are a team. Vitamins are a team. Nutrients are a team. You need a pitcher. You need a catcher. You need outfielders. You need infielders. You need everybody. And with vitamins, there is no vitamin that you don't need. There is no vitamin that's going to interfere with some other vitamin. And this is a short answer. The rare exceptions are trivial. And the bottom line is multiple vitamin, variety of foods. This is how the animal kingdom works. This is how nature does it. Take them all. Okay. In addition to vitamin C, what are the three most vital vital vitamins that you would recommend and why? <laughs> vitamins are vital. They're all vitamins. That's why they're called vitamins. It comes from vital amines. It was believed at first that they were all amines. They're not. But some of them were like thiamine, thiamine, vitamin B1. So you need them all. In terms of supplementation, to answer your question as fairly as I can, uh, vitamin C and vitamin E is an eddy and niacin are probably the big players in my opinion. These are the ones you usually don't get enough of from your diet and the ones that have the most clinical value in high doses. So that C is in Charlie, E is in Eddie, and the other one would be zoning me out here. Uh, C in niacin, ah, I need more niacin obviously. So niacin and C and E would be the ones that supplementation is most needed. But it would be an error to think that you're getting enough of the B complex in your diet. You're not. A good multivitamin three times a day solves that problem. I could add magnesium to that for minerals. Magnesium has been underappreciated because calcium has been overstressed. Magnesium is an important mineral to get plenty of, and one of the best ways to do that is as magnesium citrate. It's slightly more expensive than magnesium oxide, but it's infinitely better absorbed. Another way, if you can't find magnesium citrate, is you can just take an Epsom salts bath. That's magnesium sulfate. An Epsom salts bath will deliver magnesium to you through your skin in a very comfortable, warm, relaxing manner. Okay, this is a very different question from a lot of the questions we've had today. It comes from Holly. Do you think there will ever come a time when vitamins will be banned. I sometimes wonder, as the FDA seems willing to eliminate anything that hinders making money. And I would just add uh, that um, I was with the guy in Turkey who um, helped us with the making of that vitamin movie. And he was telling me that in Turkey, it's almost impossible to buy supplements. They're, they're basically outlawed. And even if they order them from outside the country, the government will confiscate the packages. Can you ever see that happening in the States, Andrew? Probably not, because the last time there was a big push to limit potency and availability of vitamins, Congress was flooded with so many letters, more letters than on any other issue in history, that even our legislators realized that their jobs were on the line. And this is back around 1994 or so. And you always have to pay attention to what's going on. And one thing that's always going on that you always have to pay attention to is the FDA is going to try to get vitamins into the prescriptive hands of the pharmaceutical industry, which pays the FDA's budget. So you're going to see not an unavailability of vitamins, but you're going to see a restricted availability. Once vitamins become prescription, the pharmaceutical industry will be doing megavitamin formula courses. Mm -hmm. which is a very scary thought. Another question, Andrew, um, something that's added to a lot of supplements is magnesium stearate. And this person is asking, basically, is that a problem? Is it a substance they should be avoiding? I get everybody going on this one too, but the fact is no. Stearic acid is found in foods and it is not dangerous in small amounts. It is not dangerous probably at all, but it's definitely not dangerous in the amount that you're gonna find in tablets, even if you took a lot of them. 
Linus Pauling said to avoid excipients, which is a good idea, to avoid tableting ingredients, just don't take tablets. So taking ascorbic acid in a capsule, there's fewer excipients in a capsule because you don't have to bind it together and press it into a tablet. But if you take ascorbic acid powder, there's no excipients at all. Pauling said that's a good idea. Some people that claim difficulty taking a supplement are reacting to the excipients. But more often than not, those excipients are going to be artificial colors, artificial flavors, or ferrous sulfate iron that's enough to make you throw up and made my dog throw up. When um, my children's mother was pregnant, they tried uh, giving her ferrous sulfate in her prenatal and it made her vomit. She thought it was morning sickness. The doctors were sure of it. I thought it was the ferrous sulfate. Well, guess what? We got her a natural multivitamin that did not have ferrous sulfate, but rather had ferrous fumarate in it, or ferrous gluconate, a non-vomiting type of iron. And her symptom went away, so much for that. But I figured, well, I'm not going to waste these vitamins. I'll give them to the dog. The dog threw up. You're way ahead of me. And then we threw them out because I wouldn't give ferrous sulfate even to a dog, even to a dog I didn't like. So you have to keep in mind um, that some excipients are problems. Artificial colors, artificial flavors, things like that, I think should not be in there. But magnesium stearate is simply stearic acid with magnesium stuck on it, just like ascorbic acid is ascorbate with hydrogen stuck on it, or calcium ascorbate is ascorbate with calcium stuck on it. Magnesium is good for you, most people don't get enough. So I can't see what the problem is with magnesium either. Stearic acid is in foods. So you're gonna stop eating coconut? I like coconut. I don't know anyone that's died from coconut overdose or coconut toxicity, do you? So no, the concern over magnesium stearate can be traced to people that sell products that don't contain it. And you may notice those products cost slightly more than the rest. Is there a reason? Sure, it's probably more expensive to make them. But I don't think magnesium stearate is a problem at all. I don't think stearic acid is a problem. It's found in natural foods. And I don't think magnesium is a problem. We don't get enough of it. Okay, Hannah from Holland says her supplement contains 10,000 units of vitamin D. For how long would it be safe to take this or could it possibly result in an overdose? Unless you have a clear-cut medical reason to take 10,000 units of vitamin D as in Doug a day, I think that's already an overdose. I think that's too much. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have a problem. With vitamin D, the problem usually wouldn't show up for weeks or even months. But really excessive amounts of vitamin D are, first of all, a waste of money. And secondly, they could be counterproductive. Why take that much? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Why are you taking 10,000 units? If you have a good medical reason, I have nothing more to say. But since you didn't mention that reason, I'm going to assume that you're taking that because you think it's a good idea. The vitamin D experts that I have talked to, worked with, and interviewed, would say somewhere between 1,500 and 5,000 a day is about right. Now the high one end of that is half of what you're taking. So that's why I say without any hesitation that I think you're taking too much unless you have a good reason for it that your doctor and you have decided on. I try to get less than that. In defense of the amount you're taking, you can go out in the sun in full sunlight in Florida, USA, and in half an hour, you can get three times what you're taking. But you live in Holland, where I'm reliably informed, the sun is not quite as intense as Miami. Therefore, in the winter, you might want a lot of vitamin D, but I would argue that you could take 10,000 units every other day or every third day or possibly even every week and do be doing all right. Personally, I also would add that I take in the neighborhood of three to 4,000 units of vitamin D a day. Curiously enough, I've been taking vitamin D longer than most people have been alive, I guess, at this point. And even though I've been taking vitamin D for decades in higher than RDA quantities, a physical about four years ago showed that my vitamin D level was low. And the doctor wrote on the form, you should take some vitamin D. Well, I already was. So I thought I'll take more. So I upped my vitamin D level to around three or 4,000 units a day. And I had my D tested again, it was still low. 
So I take around 5,000 or 4,000, plus I get out in the sun a lot. Now this winter, I will take more than that. But in the summer, except for you folks down under, in the summer up here now, uh, I'm taking less because I get out in the sun a great deal. I'll be taking around six or 7,000 a day during the winter because I have a known need for more that's been tested. And here's the final word, get tested. Go and have your vitamin D tested. Then you'll know. Then you'll know how much to take because you take enough to get your numbers just right. And for me, it's more than I thought. For you, it might be less than you think. Excellent. Now, this one is close to my heart um, for a couple of reasons. It's from a guy called William McRae. And if that's the Reverend William McRae, who's a singer here in Northern Ireland, we love your music, sir. If it's not, you've got the same name as someone who sings here in Northern Ireland. Um, but what he says is, Andrew, I've been shocked at the changes I've experienced with just one vitamin, niacin, 5,000 milligrams per day. I was in Ritalin for years. I did see some benefits. However, I've seen much more beneficial results on niacin. My question is, if I am experiencing such powerful results with one vitamin, is there another that I can take that will act just as powerfully for concentration and focus as niacin does? Mm. And for anyone who doesn't know, niacin is what really helped pull me out of a depressed state after many years. So, Well, niacin is the king. Uh, I appreciate your comments, and I'm glad it works so well for you. But for what you were describing, niacin is the preeminent vitamin to be taken. But you need the rest as well. You need the rest of the B-complex. And you need all the vitamins. Vitamins, by definition, are things that you cannot come up with on your own. Vitamin D, you can come up with in the presence of sunlight. You can make niacin out of tryptophan, which is in protein foods other than corn, but you don't make enough of it. So a vitamin is something that, by definition, you need to provide. You have to supply yourself with. You need them all. A good multivitamin, uh, three times a day, extra vitamin C, extra vitamin E, good idea. But niacin is the one, and you have found that by your own experience. Good for you. Glad to hear it. Very good. A uh, reminder to everybody, too, Trevor, that if you take niacin, you're going to have a flush. Now, in the megavitamin formula course, we talk about this a lot. And... I also talk about this a lot in my book with Dr. Abram Hoffer called Niacin, The Real Story. Now, this is important because Dr. Abram Hoffer was the niacin expert of the world for half a century. And he's followed, secondly, by Dr. William Parsons. And Dr. Parsons, we have a chapter from him in the niacin book as well. Parsons was at the Mayo Clinic. Abram Hoffer was director of psychiatric research for the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. And another major niacin researcher is Todd Pemberty, Dr. Todd Pemberty, and he peer reviewed my book for accuracy. So this book with Dr. Abram Hoffer, Niacin the Real Story, goes into this really, really thoroughly. And I would urge people to consider getting a copy of that book to answer your niacin questions. If you take niacin, you're going to flush. You can take no flush niacin or niacinamide and you won't flush. But there's much more to know about this, and that's why it can't be answered in a short question. I just want to flag your attention to it. Okay, thank you. If you just joined us, you'll have heard Andrew mention the mega vitamin formula course there. Um, we explained a little about it earlier in the webinar, but if you missed that, if you just click the button below this video, it'll take you to a page that'll explain uh, a very special offer that we have at the moment on the mega vitamin formula course and why you really should take advantage of it in the next couple of days. So just click the button below and you'll find that information. So in the last 15 minutes or so, this is an interesting one, Andrew, because I've heard you as well say that magnesium oxide is something we should avoid uh, because basically I think it is 3% absorption or something very, very low, according to, to Dr. Carolyn Dean. But this person is saying, I can't seem to find a multivitamin that has magnesium citrate in it. They all have the oxide form. So they're asking, is it okay to take that multivitamin with the oxide form and then supplement with magnesium citrate on the side? Yes. Okay, so the magnesium oxide is not doing any harm. It's simply not delivering what you need. Exactly right. Okay. And by the way, magnesium oxide is better than absolutely no magnesium whatsoever. And Dr. Carolyn Dean also talks about that. She said people will even get good results of magnesium oxide. It's just that it's inefficient. And if you take magnesium citrate, it's much more effective and you get better results. And that's the bottom line. But there's no harm from magnesium oxide. Oh, no. 
Okay. Uh, this is a question from Daphne, who's down under. Um, no, Daphne's not down under. That's someone else. So, Daphne, wherever you're from, excuse me for turning you into an Australian. This is about calcium and vitamin II supplements. Dr. Saul, I wanted to say thank you for all you've done and continue to do to make the world a healthier place. My question is, what are your thoughts on skipping a calcium supplement and adding vitamin K2? Do most of us get all the calcium we need from diet? I do take a magnesium and a vitamin D supplement as well. I think you're on the right track. If you're taking magnesium and vitamin D, you're going to just be healthier in general, and I think you're going to use your calcium more efficiently. We get quite a lot of calcium from our diet, particularly in America, where we have a lot of dairy products, or at least most people do. In China, people eat much less dairy, and they have uh, much lower calcium intakes, but they actually have less osteoporosis. So it's a suggestion that maybe you're not just a calcium factory. Uh, Dr. Tom Levy and others have talked about how people get too much calcium, and there's much to be said for this, with the conspicuous exception of growing children and pregnant women. They need calcium and no mistake because they're building bone, building a body. And in the first parts of life, before birth and in the 20 years after it, you're still growing and you need more calcium. But that does not mean we have to heavy duty calcium supplement. So I think you're right on the nose there. Calcium supplements, I think you can avoid. And magnesium and vitamin D, I think you need. With vitamin K, your vitamin K supplement should be two teaspoons of cooked kale a day. And don't tell me you can't do that. Because one teaspoon of cooked kale has the RDA for vitamin K. So two teaspoons of cooked kale a day is all the K you need. I know there's a lot of talk about vitamin K. Can it be converted? Is there enough? The other thing you need to remember is if people go plant-based and if they have yogurt, they're going to produce and absorb vitamin K internally as well. So yogurt, plant-based diet, kale, and your magnesium and vitamin D. Good plan. Okay. This is one I'm sure you'll know the answer to because um, when I was having problems, I travel a lot for people who don't know, and Andrew recommended I get some melatonin into me to help me sleep, and uh, it, it certainly did help me sleep. So this is from uh, someone called, they've just signed themselves as RTK, and it says, I'm currently taking a melatonin supplement every other night, which contains zinc, selenium, and three milligrams of melatonin. Other sleep experts suggest between half a milligram and one milligram should be the maximum. Any thoughts on that? Melatonin does help a lot of people. Short-term use is advisable. You can even take more. There have been studies where people have been given 200 um, milligrams of melatonin. They had pretty severe bedhead the next day, but you know nobody was dying. Overdosing on melatonin is obviously something you don't want to do simply because your body can make it. And I used to take melatonin, I used to take quite a lot, more than you're taking, and I found that if I darkened the room, you make more melatonin. That's true, you know. You keep your room scrupulously dark when you sleep, and you will make more melatonin. The second thing I do is I take niacin at bedtime. And the third thing I do, absolutely nobody wants to discuss, and nobody wants to do, and so naturally we're gonna discuss it, and I do it. And that is, you go to bed early. I go to bed at 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock. If I'm up until 9, I'm burning the midnight oil and partying hardy because that is late for me. Trevor, stop smiling. <laughs> uh, Johnny Carson had Ed McMahon. I've got Trevor King. Well, what you have to understand here is that I don't go to bed at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night because I think it's fun. I do it because it works. And what happens is you make more melatonin, you have a better night's sleep. You just do. Ayurvedic medicine in India has been talking about the time cycles of the day. And by going to bed during the kapha cycle, before the pitta cycle, you actually do have better sleep. So that's what I suggest you do. Go to bed early and take some niacin, and then melatonin becomes irrelevant. When you're traveling, you're jet lagged, who knows when you're going to bed. When I went to Korea, it was a 12 hour jet lag. And man, oh man, I wish I'd had more melatonin. But for most people, darken the room, go to bed early, take niacin. Melatonin is strictly optional. Okay, we're into our last few minutes here. Um, 
This is a really interesting one, actually. I, um, Jeanette says, I'm a pensioner on a low income, so I cannot afford to take as much or as many high dose supplements as I'd like to. But I am, is taking, what she asks is, is taking above RDA but less than optimal dosage better than no dosage at all? Or are dosages which fall below your recommendations pointless and a waste of money? Some is better than none. If I were on the desert and I were very, very thirsty <laughs> and I came along and there was a kid with a Kool-Aid stand with ice cubes and Kool-Aid and I don't drink Kool-Aid but I were very thirsty and it costs three dollars for a glass I would not say that's too expensive <laughs> I would not say I don't like red coloring I would not say I don't like the flare flavor and I would not say the glass isn't big enough <laughs> I would pay the kids a hundred bucks and down the pitcher. And you know, I'd probably still be thirsty. But any port in a storm. So you do the best you can. If you are having difficulty affording vitamins, spend your money on multivitamins and extra C. That's where you really want to do it. And this can bring your supplement costs down to a very low level. I spend about a dollar a day, maybe a dollar forty a day, somewhere in there. And I take a lot of vitamins. But if you were taking a good multi three times a day and extra vitamin C, it would be way under a dollar. And that's way under $365 a year. And I don't have to tell you what copays cost, what hospital stays cost. I don't have to tell you what brake work on your car costs or what it costs to have a person come and service your washing machine. You can afford somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 bucks a year for your health. And if you can't, you need to get some assistance so you can. I'm not taking this lightly, but you really can do a good job on a low budget. So is some better than a lot? Absolutely. Okay, very quick one from Christopher. I watched that vitamin movie and read one of your books afterwards. I have just one question. Should one take a pause for any reason from taking vitamins on a daily basis? Only if you're going to take a pause from breathing, eating. No, I think it's uh, purely philosophical. There's a lot of stuff out there where people try to complicate this. Look, you need your vitamins to help your body feel good. So you want to feel good all the time, so you take your vitamins every day. Children should wash their hands before every meal, say please and thank you, and take your vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to finish off with one last question. And you can talk about this for hours. Why isn't the importance of vitamins, especially in megadoses, taught more generally in health coaching? because you haven't made sure that it is. It's us. Like Pogo said, we've met the enemy and they is us. The reason it's avoided is because we've allowed it to be avoided. I think we should make a movie to bring forward the value of megavitamin therapy. Hey, we did one. It's called That Vitamin Movie. I think we should have website. We have, we have DrSelf.com. People tell me you should write books. I've done 13 of them. And if you really want to go to the big one that has the most information, if you really want to get into this in detail, it's called The Orthomolecular Treatment of Chronic Disease. This is a huge book. It's like, I don't know how many pages. I think it's 800 pages, half a million words, double column, big book, and it weighs four and a half pounds. You can thud that on your doctor's desk when they say, I don't see any evidence in big ones can cure disease. Well, just give them that book and maybe that'll help persuade them. But the real reason this nonsense goes on and this sick world exists is because we're allowing it. So you and I have to do our part to make sure that we teach people and the way we teach them is by example. The great American humorist Will Rogers famously said, men's minds are changed by observation, not by argument. So show them. Be well, get your family well, get your friends well. It's going to catch on. Sooner or later, people are going to listen to the old Chinese saying, when you're sick of sickness, you're no longer sick. 
So the thing to do is take that action. And if you want this taught, make sure that it is. Write to the newspapers, get on the internet, show your friends, protest, make sure political candidates know about this, push like crazy. Don't let them lead you by the nose. You're an adult, stand up for yourself. I will, you do it, we'll get somewhere. Absolutely. If you're interested in that vitamin movie which Andrew talks about, go to thatvitaminmovie.com. You can buy a DVD there for not very much at all. Give it to your friends. And uh, that has created a lot of discussion and helped a lot of people. Andrew, thank you for giving so generously, as always, of your time. I know you do this ex gratis. And uh, we appreciate what you do. We appreciate how many people you've helped. And we appreciate the last 90 minutes. So thank you. Thank you, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be with everybody today. Thank you, sir. So we leave it there, folks. I'm really sorry if we didn't get your question. Like I say, we had 45 pages of them. I think we got through around 10 pages. We would have been here a very long time to get through them all. But thank you for sending them in. If you would like to find out more about the Mega Vitamin Formula course, like we said earlier on, the information, just click the button below the video, and that will take you and explain a very special offer that we have for the course coming up in October. So we hope this has been helpful to you. We thank you. For joining us, we would ask you to go and join our Facebook page. There's stuff posted there every week. We never answer questions there, so you're wasting your time posting them. I would just tell you in advance, simply because we, there's way too many for us to do that. But uh, join us on Facebook, andrewsoll.com, doctoryourself.com, and if you're interested in the course, it's andrewsollcourse.com. Thank you again. Have a good evening.